Hello everybody, welcome to the NCA webinar. Fantastic to see you all joining. I can see the numbers rushing up as usual. Now we are joined by three amazing NCO conductors today. So we're going to have a conversation all about what the point of a conductor is. Lots of questions to ask them and lots of wisdom for them to share with you. So just while everybody's joining, let me tell you, in order to ask a question, you just go down to the bottom of the screen and there's a QA and a button and you just press on that, type in your question for us and it'll be sent to me and I will do my best to ask these guys whatever it is you want to know. Um, and there'll also be some polling that you can vote on to find out some top secrets that you can't find out anywhere else about these amazing people. Okay, so um, I can see that loads of you are here. The numbers seem to have stopped going up. So I'm going to start um, with a little bit of a screen share. Here we go. So um, we are asking these lovely conductors, what are we watching for? When we have a conductor in our orchestra, what is it? that we are looking for. And these are the conductors that we had hoped to be working with today. All sorts of amazing musicians, um, not today, sorry, last uh, over this year. Um, and sadly, we haven't been able to work with very many of them, but we have three of them here with us today. Um, but I know all the rest of them want to send you all their love as well. And we're very much looking forward to seeing them all again and being back in our orchestras as soon as possible. But we have today with us Jonathan Bloxham, Caroline Hobsmith and Natalia Louis-Bassa. So um, we're going to be talking about these seven things. What is the point of a conductor? Um, what are the beating patterns that they beat to show us the tempo? Then a little bit about tempo, speed, changing speed, those kind of things. Then dynamics, how do they show us how loud to play? Then we're going to talk about communicating emotion and building character in music. Uh, we're going to look a little bit at how we interpret scores and how we work out what it is that composers want. And then the final big topic is about how we listen to music. So let's kink things off with introducing ourselves. Caroline, would you be able to introduce yourself for us? Yes, Welcome. of course, Claire. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here and to think about all you guys out there. Um, I, what can I tell you? I'm from South Africa, as you can possibly hear from my accent. I started the, the flute only at the age of 13, where you, the, the younger photo that you can see here, I was aged five and at nursery school, desperate to learn an instrument, but there were no teachers available. I could not learn. I would have had to travel the half an hour to get to somebody who could teach me music um, or give me a music lesson. And uh, for me at that, t for my mum at that time, it was impossible. I was the youngest of five and she simply couldn't afford it. So I had to wait, but it was worth waiting for. And there you can see me age 16, um, having been learning the flute for about two years, um, just absolutely lapping it up, loving every moment. Um, from there, I went to the Johannesburg University, it's known as the University of the Witwatersrand, and then on to the Royal College of Music, where I did a postgrad. Um, backwards and forwards to South Africa and the UK. And in that time, I started doing lots of playing with the National Symphony Orchestra in South Africa. And that for me was fascinating because we had visiting conductors and we got to watch every two weeks, a new conductor, a new style. And I found that fascinating. But all along, um, there was no thought of being a conductor because women just weren't conductors and certainly not in South Africa. So my heart was totally set on being a flautist. And so it continued. Um, we came here about 20 years ago. Of course, coming from somewhere like, like South Africa, it felt like musical heaven and just so much music happening. And it was only 10 years ago I actually became a conductor. Um, and it was a, so my journey has been pretty unusual. It began with somebody persuading me to do the audition for this job that you see me doing, which is with the County Youth Orchestra, the Oxfordshire School Symphony Orchestra. Um, where I live and I didn't expect to get in but I thought doing the audition would be good fun because I could just have a go with a big orchestra and then somehow I, I got the job so and it sort of evolved from there. Fantastic thank you Caroline. Uh, Jonathan do you want to tell us a little bit about you? Yes, thanks, Kath. It's great. Um, well, I can't see you all there, but it's great that we're all together and I'm so sad to miss you all at Easter this year. So my name is Jonathan. I'm from the northeast of England, although I don't have a Geordie accent. And so 
that sometimes is confusing for people. Um, I started off as a cellist, page eight. I uh, studied in the local, there I am, looking much more innocent. Um, and um, I studied cello from the local, in the local primary school, state privatetic teacher, then I went to study at the UD Menland School. And it wasn't until I was 26 that actually I decided to swap from the cello to be a, become a conductor. Um, and I was so grateful to have a lot of chamber music and orchestral playing, of course, I played in the NCO myself, which uh, makes it even more special each time I come back because those early orchestral memories are so ingrained in my mind and are so important to me. And so it's um, the most special orchestra to work with every year, I would say. Thank you, Jonathan. And Natalia, can you tell us a little bit about you and your background? Thank you, Kat. Yes, hello, everybody. Um, well, uh, as you can hear from my accent, well, I am from Venezuela. Um, I was born there and I belong to the very well-known uh, El Sistema from Venezuela. So I was, uh, I started with the oboe, although very, very small, my, my parents put me to play a bit of the piano, as you can see in the photos. Uh, my instrument was the oboe because I wanted to belong to an orchestra. I wanted to be in an orchestra because I wanted to be a conductor since I was very, very small. And like Caroline said, well, not only in Venezuela, we're not women conductors, but conductors at all. So we, the person that was uh, best in the theory of music were the ones that were conducting the Sistema orchestras around the country. But step by step, things were getting better. And uh, I graduated in conducting in Venezuela. And then I came to London to study at the Royal College of Music. And then, many years later, I ended up teaching at the Royal College of Music, which is what I am doing right now. I am teaching orchestral conducting there, having a wonderful time, and being very lucky and grateful because all those means have bought me or brought me to the National Children's Orchestra, where I have been working with for around 10 years already. So that's more or less what my history, very, very short, is about. Thank you so much, Natalia. Fantastic. So I'll come out of the screen share now and um, we'll come to our first question, our first topic, which is what is the point of a conductor? Would you like to take that one, Caroline? <laughs> I think this is a really good question. It gets raised so often because we all know a conductor can play without a, I mean, a com an orchestra can play without a conductor rather. Um, and really the, the whole role of a professional conductor is very recent. Um, probably late 1800s, we see it coming, it's happening for the first time. Up until then, uh, orchestras had been led by the principal violinist or keyboard player who would do the necessary cueing or keeping time. And uh, the whole notion that there would be a person solely dedicated to waving a stick was just crazy at that time. There were some exceptions. Lully famously managed to kill himself with his conducting staff, which he used to beat on the floor and uh, managed to hit his foot and it became infected. He was a, a dancer as well as a musician. He didn't want to have that foot amputated. And sadly, two months later, he, he died of septicemia. Um, but going back to orchestras and why, we, why they're conductors, uh, during the 1800s, things started to change. Uh, everything got bigger. So uh, you just have to look at Beethoven symphonies. The first symphony, it's, you could be playing Mozart, it's double woodwind, small orchestra. By the ninth symphony, you have about 200 musicians on the stage with singers and so on. So it just became logistically vital for there to be a conductor. Um, and this, of course, was reinforced by the famous composer conductors of the 1800s, Wagner and so on, uh, Mahler. It's almost impossible to do a Mahler symphony without that person waving. Um, and so we come to why, uh, what the conductor actually does. Um, on the simplest level, we set the tempo. We get the orchestra going. Um, we might do a bit of cueing or, uh, and that sort of thing. We just help everyone along. Slightly more complex, we bring our own interpretation to it. We have a vision, if you like. Um, we believe we have some connection, we understand how the composer was thinking and so dynamics, uh, tempi, uh, all these, all the aspects of music we might address and do our own version of things. And then finally, 
there's a, something that's often overlooked. There's something that happens in the rehearsal process. There's a connection. There's a collaboration, hopefully. Um, and if this is done in the right way and the right atmosphere is created, then all that work that goes on in rehearsal somehow is elevated and something special happens. And that collaboration, that connection is, is I think, one of the most exciting areas that we maybe think about the least because we're so concerned with technique and getting our way around notes. Um, but that, in essence, uh, is my view. I've probably forgotten some things, and I know Jonathan and Natalia will, will put me straight, but those are the, some of the key elements. Right, great. So we have a poll. Thank you for that, Caroline. The first poll to find out our secrets of our guests says that one of our guests has completed an Ironman triathlon, which involves a 2.4 mile swim, a 112 mile bicycle ride and a marathon to 26.2 mile run. Who is it? One of our guests has medals for ballroom dancing. Who is it? And one of our guests used to have a bilingual cat called Cleopatra. Who is that? Okay, so we'll find out our answers. And we have had our first uh, question actually from Maya, who wants to ask you, Jonathan, what is your favorite piece of music to conduct? Wow, that is a very, very difficult question. It's like what someone's favorite piece of music is to listen to. Um, because of course, depending on your moods, depending on the time of year, maybe even, this can change. But right now, and not just because it's his birthday year, I love conducting Beethoven. I think it's um, not just the most fascinating thing from a musical point of view, but it, like Caroline said, it's exactly at that point where the conductor starts to be needed. And so it's kind of somewhere between chamber music where everyone's listening. And again, the collaboration that Caroline spoke about, which is so key, no matter how big an orchestra is. So somewhere between this and somewhere between something where actually we're needed. And so this music, I think, is just the most exciting. It's visceral. It's got everything in it. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. Have you voted on your polls? Yes. Great. OK, shall we find out the results? Let's share the results of the poll. OK, so uh, most people, 51 think percent think Jonathan's done an Iron Man. Um, Forty-three percent think Caroline has ballroom dancing medals, and forty-two percent think that Natalia has a bilingual cat. Um, uh, Jonathan, do you want to tell us what the answer is for you? So I'm flattered that people think that I could possibly do an Iron Man, but that's not the case. In fact, when I was young, I did ballroom dancing. And so I have silver and gold medals from my local ballroom dancing competitions. And I'd say, as a conductor, gesture is very important. So I'm very grateful for my mum to have suggested that I do that as a child. <laughs> and uh, Natalia, can you tell us uh, which is the right answer for you? The right answer is Cleopatra, my Cleo, my lovely Cleo, the Queen of England, <laughs> the second Queen of England. You have to see her in the countryside. She's the owner of the whole countryside. And she speaks two languages. We speak to her in Spanish and in English. Just both languages. So that leaves you, Caroline. Tell us about tell us about you. I know it sounds crazy, and here I am in pink, but actually there's a side of me you don't know about. I'm a bit of a toughie inside. And um a part of the inspiration my husband had at the time when we he first met, he was a, tri a triathlete. And he got me going and I think I hadn't quite done a marathon by the time I did the event, but he's, he's sort of, he's very gung ho and he just said, you'll be fine, just go for it. And uh, it, it was the most phenomenal experience. Uh, I, I'm, it just shows you, and it's something worth remembering, you can always do a whole lot more than you ever think you can. Somewhere deep down inside, there's an, there's an iron person in all of us. So yeah, I wish I could say I had the dancing medals. Yay. That's great. <laughs> We respect you, Caroline. Uh, That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So let's come on to our next topic, which is beating patterns. OK, so if we're new, uh, some of our kids are quite new to orchestral playing. So could you take us through the basic beating patterns? So beating two in a bar, beating three in a bar and beating four in a bar. Do you want to kick us off, Caroline? Sure. Um, OK, so two in a bar is the simplest one. Um, we've got a downbeat and we've got an upbeat. So as the name suggests, notice though that we give a little bit of a flick or an acceleration 
there and there. And what that does is pinpoints the, the point at which that beat actually happens. So for instance, two, four, I might do land of hope and glory. So we go, da, 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 and that's six, that's two, four. Beautiful voice. Thank you, Caroline. Um, so who's going to take three? Natalia, do you want to take three? Yay. Good. <laughs> the three is like a triangle, actually, where the vertical is exactly in front of us, and then it goes sideways to the right, a bit higher, and then to the off. To off. So it goes down, right, up, down, right, up. And if I sing something, I will say something like a uh, host Jupiter, something like something like that. Clear? Awesome. Who needs an orchestra, hey? Eh? <laughs> <laughs> and Jonathan, do you want to take four for us? What does four look like? Absolutely. So four is a little bit more complicated. I'll try and stand up. We can all stand up together if you want. So I always yeah, imagine that there's, I imagine that there's a little table in front of us always. And so most of the beats of four go on this table. Like Italia says, beat one straight in front of us to the middle. And then beat two goes, well, it looks the wrong way to you, but it goes left. And then three to right off the screen somewhere and four back up the middle. So you're almost drawing this beautiful kind of line down and a flat line across. So if we were to sing a song, it would, it would be a very, very slow Ina Kleiner nap music. Lum, <laughs> dum, dim, dum, dim, dum, dim, dum, dim. Something like this. But I think I, it's just, a, basically, it's just each time from what Caroline, Natalia and I said, it's just adding another direction in. It's a beautiful, simple language. Fantastic, thank you for that. So that's, we've done what's the point of a conductor and our beating patterns. Now let's go to the next topic, which is speed or tempo. Starting the music, choosing the speed, stopping it, slowing it down, speeding it up. Who'd like to take that one? I'll talk about that. Great. Um, so I think one of the most important things um, before any sound is made, of course, is, and it's to do with starting, is the upbeat, which is sort of the fancy word for breath, I would say. And so again, if we all stand up, if we, if we take a breath, if we take a breath in, you see the chest going up. And the upbeat is something similar to this. It's the beat that happens before any sound is made. And this is where the tempo is set. So if we're doing something like that very slow Ina Kleiner nap music, then I was, I'm already thinking what that tempo is. And so that the upbeat, in this case, it would be the fourth beat if it was in four, comes, comes as the way up before. And I always breathe, of course, I was a trained string player. And if you're a singer or a woodwind player, you need to actually physically take a breath first. String players, pianists, we get away with not doing that sometimes. We need to remember always, and especially in orchestra, when you're playing with colleagues that also breathe, but also really breathe before we take a, play a stroke or anything like this. So that beat is just like a breath. Stopping the music is in some ways a little simpler. I suppose the two most normal ways of a piece to end is with a short note, in which case, when it stops, it stops. And the other example at the end of the piece is where you land on a long note. And the same, it's kind of the reverse that happens. And often I would say that the sound is, uh, as for con us conductors, has been held in our hands. And so when you close this hand, it implies the closing of the sound. Of course, as conductors, we have so many different ways of doing this. But these would definitely work if you wanted to stand in front of an orchestra and try it. And that's the most important thing. So you've got a big loud note at the end of a piece and stop. Or you could have a very quiet note at the end of the piece and stop it gently too. I think these are two amazing things. Changing speed, there were, again, us conductors, when we study it, we have so many different things available to us. But for one example that I like thinking of is if we can all imagine right now, well, that our hands are in water. Just move your hand in front of you as if you're in water. And you can um, just pretend it water's got more resistance, doesn't it, than air itself. Air is very easy. Water. Now imagine it's treacle. 
And what's what's thicker than treacle? Now imagine it's very almost almost hard concrete, but not quite, and you're really trying to push it through. Now, one way of changing the speed is to change the dent, this feeling of density around you. So, of course, you could just say move your hand slower, but I like to think that the quality of the speed change and the quality of the sound um, has a relevance to this too. So, in your own time, when you're in a swimming pool, put your hands above and then in the water, and you'll feel that resistance. And that's what I try to imagine when I'm conducting sometimes. So, a few little suggestions. Thank you. Jonathan, that's amazing. So we've got a question for you, Natalia, from Anna. Are slow pieces or fast pieces harder to conduct? What a great question. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't get it. Is, are, are slow pieces or, or fast pieces harder to conduct? Good one. I think in my humble opinion, and this is mine, I think slow are harder to conduct because there is much more expression and once again like Jonathan said I mean so much space between one beat and the other that you need to master not to speed up because orchestras are extremely responsive and whatever they see from us they will react almost immediately if not immediately they react very sudden so I will say slow and there is also expression to convey when the slow thing is. Most of the times I would say that when the things are fast, very rarely probably the musicians are going to look up to the conductors. They are more focused on their score, looking at all those demi semi quavers or whatever. When it is slow, they have the chance to see the inspiration of the conductor and, and enjoy the music. The answer is slow, I think. <laughs> Agree? Look, we've got a poll about you, Natalia. How perfect timing. Natalia's favourite foods are Marmite and cheese sandwiches, Nutella and olives, but not together, baked potatoes and baked beans, quavers and Cadbury crunchy, but again not together, or Percy pigs and fruit pastels. Okay, so what is it that Natalia loves? You guys, are going, have you voted, Jonathan? I voted. You voted, you voted, great. So we'll find out what the answer is in just a minute. Now we've got another question, perhaps for you, um, Caroline, from Noah. Which areas of conducting are you still learning about? Mikey, I don't know if that ever ends. Um, it's, it's a really good, I'm glad you raised that, Noah, because in fact, people seem to think that, you know, you can reach a point like grade eight where you can just do everything. But I, I hope, I, I'm sure my colleagues share this opinion that the, the learning never ends. And in fact, I've come to conducting quite late. So I have a mentor um, and I'm, I enjoy the collaboration so much and learning from this person that I, I would want that to continue even, you know, because of the joy of learning. Do you, do you all feel that it's still a journey for you all Absolutely. every day? Absolutely. Yeah. I, think, I think the beauty of what Caroline just said is that having a mentor, I think that sometimes when we are young string players, or I remember that, even like after college or in college, I'm like, I'll probably stop having lessons at some point. Where actually opera singers, and I think also conductors, tend to always have some older mentors who are wiser, who have more experience, and that no matter what level we reach, we always uh, go there. I think I was going to mention this at another point, but there's a wonderful interview of Sir Colin Davis um, uh, in, in the psychiatrist chair on BBC Radio 4 on a podcast. It's wonderful to listen to. Um, and he says that conducting is 15% music and 85% human people, people and relationships. And again, of course, as we grow and get older and work out how to, this collaboration with people, um, as a young conductor, I feel like I've got so much obviously to learn in all these areas. But you notice that I'm, I think that's a very wise thing to say from someone as Sir Colin Davis. Fantastic. Right, we've got the results of our poll. Here they are. 54% um, think that you love Nutella and olives, Natalia. Is that true? Absolutely. I can yeah. leave. I can <laughs> leave on olives. I can leave just on olives. I love them. You could just live on that alone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Green, well, black, purple, you name it. Big, small. Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful fruit. <laughs> Great, fantastic, absolutely right. Okay, now moving on to our next topic, which is dynamics. Caroline, do you want to talk to us about dynamics? 
Of course. Um, so dynamics uh, are very easily communicated, I feel, as a conductor, because people respond very readily to that visual cue of something bigger, meaning something louder, and then a smaller gesture, meaning something softer. So usually that side of it is, is easy to communicate. Uh, but it gets a little more complicated with, because music is full of complexities of texture. And so you might have a, a section that's loud in the orchestra, it's forte, but certain sections of the orchestra need to be heard above the rest. Somebody gave a very beautiful um, idea of how you can imagine this is in a great work of art, you might have something that is the subject of that piece of art and then something in the middle ground and something in the background. And um, you want to bring the subject to the fore and keep the middle ground and background slightly further back. And you can do this with tone color, but obviously dynamic is important because then you create the layers and your audience can hear the important material or they can see that picture as it should be heard. Um, so you might want to give an encouraging look at a certain section or turn towards them if it's the strings with the big theme and the brass and woodwind have more um, accompanying figures, then you might want to give a sort of encouraging look and gesture more towards the strings and so on. So it does get a little more complicated, but essentially that's how I would do it. Fantastic. So we've got a question relating to that actually, Caroline, which you might want to take from Anna, which says, do conductors ever change or decide new dynamics in a piece? Do you have that freedom? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Um, and I think that's part of that learning process that Noah was asking about. I think that as you, insights and ideas come to the fore, you know, the way we play Mozart has changed so much over the last 30, 40 years. Um, all these ideas are in the mix, your own knowledge and understanding. You, there's maybe also a playful side of a conductor that, that likes to try something new. You know, we, we don't always know what's going to work. And sometimes an accident even in a rehearsal will bring out something that you 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 know you'll think wow that was amazing and you'll latch on to it um so yeah that i would say we do change and the other thing i don't know if natalia or jonathan have experienced this but there's so much in a score and you can think you've studied a score back to front and you'll open it up two years later and see something you didn't see before and so you know that i've had that a few a good few times so there you go <laughs> Definitely. But I think there's also the, the, the follow-on for that. Sometimes in performance, it's nice to experiment and be playful a little bit. And actually, if you have that connection with the, with the orchestra, and depending on the music, of course, you can suddenly change those dynamics. Something could be a little quieter than it was going to be before, or it can be surprisingly loud. And again, that's to, and to root back to what we're all talking about, which is connection and watching and things like this. Sometimes that, rather than just playing what's in your part, which is, of course, very important, or what you've rehearsed, having that spontaneity is key too. Oh, Jonathan, we've got a poll about you. Perfect timing. Jonathan is not scared of much, but he is scared of wasps, of missing flights, of global warming, of falling off his motorbike, or of splitting his trousers in a concert. Okay. Have you voted, Natalia? Mm, yes. <laughs> I want to know if it's ever happened to Jonathan <laughs> that he split well, his We tongue. might come to that. We might come to that in a minute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that might be a bit of a leading <laughs> question. <laughs> Great. So while everybody's answering that one, um, Natalia, do you want to talk us about our fifth uh, topic, which is communicating emotion or building character in music? Tell us a little bit about how conductors do that. Well, because we have a a piece of paper that has black and white sound. I mean, something written that doesn't sound is very much up to us as interpreters, and that includes the musicians of the orchestra, to bring them to life. However, there are two types of music that we have to be aware of. There are There is the programmatic music that has always behind a program, a plot, a libretto, let's say a, a, a music, po a symphonic poem, where a poem, uh, something literary is involved, we try to recreate it in music. So there is something that we as interpreters can grab on because there is a character behind. For example, there is Smetana's Mad Last um, or Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony where he is trying to depict uh, different uh, 
scenes and landscapes, and we have to recreate that. But there is another kind of music, which is the absolute music or abstract music, which is actually the majority of it, where nothing is behind, not a plot, not a personage, you know, a character or a protagonist or anyone. And it's up to us conductors to create those characters. If depending on how the music sounds, depending on how the music flows, we have to create either ogres and get very angry with our facial expression and body language, or if the music is very soft and beautiful, we have to create fairy queens, beautiful butterflies, cats, also sorry, birds, <laughs> or something, you know, very, very beautiful, any film very much depends depend on us, on how we create it with our facial expression. So um, we can communicate emotions, and I think this is crucial for us as conductors being in front of an orchestra. Because if you go to YouTube, you can Google robot conducting, and you will see many, many videos of robots conducting, and the orchestra is following perfectly, but there is something else that is missing and this is extra ingredient which will never fade away and will never die the human thing the emotion that we put on it thank goodness <laughs> Yay. that's the, that's the fun bit isn't it great we've got the answer to jonathan poll so 62 percent think you're most scared <laughs> of putting your trousers in a concert <laughs> but what is the what is the real answer jonathan well i mean I suppose there are two answers. As it happens right now, my fear is missing flights um, because I missed one last week. And so that's very prevalent on my mind, though some of you who might have seen the webinar before has, will know that one of the most embarrassing things that has actually happened to me on stage, Caroline, is splitting <laughs> my trousers. Oh my God. <laughs> and so I suppose I'm fearful of it, but I've, you know, I've got some experience now, and so it's okay. <laughs> so that follows on very nicely to some questions that we've had that we always have which is what has the most embarrassing conducting moment for you i've taken that 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 is yours jonathan natalia have you ever had a really embarrassing conducting moment very similar to jonathan's it was <laughs> with the national children's orchestra i think it was at the colston hall in bristol uh we were ready the orchestra already tuned leader in already i'm about to get in and when i am getting in on stage the heel my shoe heel fell or fell i mean it was completely detached from the foot from the shoe and, <laughs> and, and i was like what can i do what shall i do and i so my dawn and i went and i almost slipped because i didn't have the you know this rubber thing that you know and I, it was really, really scary, really, really scary and very embarrassing because, of course, everybody got this, the orchestra, the audience, because I was mad, <laughs> really mad. So yeah. what did you, did you take your shoes off? How did you conduct the concert? No, so, because the heel was, okay, it was the top, you know, this little thing that, I don't know how to call it in Spanish, in English. Is this a rubber thing that they put on the heel? The heel remains on the shoe. On the shoe. Oh, okay. But there is this little thing, rubber oh, thing. Oh, the that they Yeah, yeah, yeah. The top, I think it's called. I don't know. <laughs> that thing left the shoe, and the, the heel stayed completely empty inside. Oh, that was horrible! Horrible. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Caroline? Have you had a similar embarrassing oh, moment? Oh wow. Um, I think it was when I drew blood with the baton. That that was the worst, but probably. I, I mean, I've thrown sticks in all directions and broken sticks, but this was, I think I was doing Carmen. It was in Spain and it was, the, you know, the, the destiny, that theme. And I managed to just spear this hand with the baton, but so badly that drips of blood. I mean, I've got the score today with drips of blood going across it. So, yeah, I, I mean, I don't, I hope there weren't elderly people in the front row that fainted or, or you know, I'm not sure. <laughs> but I was just horrified to see blood all over the place. And there's nothing you can do, of course. You just have to sail on. But yeah, that's probably been my worst moment. I'm waiting for the splitting trousers, though. That's bound to happen at some point. No! <laughs> the shoe, yeah. 
Great. Well, thank you for that, guys. So coming back to our sixth point, it is interpreting the score. Who'd like to take that one? I can say something about this. Um, it's a perfect follow on from what Natalia was saying, because of course it's, it's so incredibly linked and there are so many things we could talk about. But I think one interesting thing to consider in addition to what Natalia says is stylistics, because of course, and what I mean by that is when pieces were written. And so if we think back to the instruments that, for example, Beethoven used and how they developed since then or before and Bach used and things like this, then actually we, we, we know as much as we can do if we study stylistics that they approached playing different ways. And so the way that I'd, I'd kind of think about it when we now work is that you don't want your Shostakovich to sound like your Beethoven or your Mozart to sound like your Elgar. So for each different composer, I think we as players, or we as conductors, we as musicians, need to find a different palette of colors to then tell the stories that Natalia is talking about. And so it's kind of like another, it's like another thing we have to add on to, um, to when we're working, when we're interpreting, is are these things. And of course, if we look at the scores, it's also very interesting because Mozart doesn't put that much information in the score. He'd maybe write forte, maybe a couple of staccato dots, maybe piano. Elgar, on the other hand, writes on one note, sforzando, tunito, uh, legato, accent, so many things just on one note, and it's, it's almost too much information. And so how do, we, how do we know what to do with a whole bar of quavers in Mozart? And of course, as conductors, we have to come, we come to the rehearsal with some idea about this, but we have to put on the glasses of the Mozart era or the glasses of the Beethoven era and try and see the music through the prism of those times. And I think then what we have is a concert, if we have a Mozart overture, and a Tchaikovsky concerto and Stravinsky at the end is not just three different pieces, it's three total different sound oral worlds of all these stories that we're trying to tell. And I think that is definitely for me, one of the most exciting things about being not just a conductor, but a musician. Thank you so much. Oh look, we've got another poll. Um, if our guests had a superpower, it, they would like it to be, somebody wants carbon capture somebody wants invisibility and somebody wants time travel so let's see how that one comes out now lots of people have been asking apparently how do you practice conducting at home natalia do you want to take that one how do you practice how do i practice i it depends. It very much depends on the piece. If the piece is a piece that I have played before in the orchestra, uh, there is an approach. If the piece is a piece that I have never played, but I know it by ear, it has another approach. If the piece is completely new, there is another approach. Nowadays, on my 21st century, we are living at, I don't think we should reject the marvelous uh, media that we have, YouTube videos, stuff. I have, I am, for example, right now studying a Stravinsky piece, and I am going to try and look for even the piece conducted by Stravinsky to see if it was, and there are videos in YouTube, so I cannot miss that. So what I'm going to try to do is to immerse the most possible into the, what the interpreter or the composer wanted. I'm going to I am going to study, and this complements a lot to what Jonathan said about interpretation, to place myself on the period of the history of music we, we are at. If it is Beethoven, what was Beethoven doing? Was he deaf at, at the moment he composed such or such piece? Was he angry? Was he uh, politically involved with something? What was happening politically? And that amazingly helps a lot to create like an idea for interpretation. And that's the way more or less I, I play. I, I try to do the most possible silence work at home on a train, on an airplane, and read the score. And I'm not going to be on an airplane beating the thing, but I am going to start more or less thinking, okay, how or what am I going to do on this bar? Am I needed? Am I really needed by the orchestra on this bar? And, and so on. Those are the things. Please help me, Caroline and, and, and Jonathan, <laughs> with more, more tips, because I think there are many more. I'm pretty oh, sure. I totally agree. It's a very complex thing. And I think it's very individual as well. I like to, my score to be marked up in a certain way. 
um, it, it's just facilitates everything. Uh, I, an image that I have sometimes is like you, you're in an airplane flying down to an island and in learning a piece. And first of all, you can just see the outline of this island. Um, and that's all you know about the island. And as you get closer, you might see a mountain or a river. And so you get closer and closer and you see more and more and you add more and more detail. So it's, it's a process, isn't it? I don't know what you think, Natalia. It's, mm. it, it is a sort of from, a process from of micro, from micro to, to micro, from yeah, micro to down. micro. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Sorry, Jonathan, you carry on. No, no, absolutely. I, I completely agree. I think there's, of course, there's the, there's the kind of other side as well, which is even more difficult to talk about, which is the kind of practicing all these movements and things as well. Because I, I often believe that, or I do believe that there's a craft of conducting and of course, especially if you're in front of a professional orchestra, but even you guys in the National Children's Orchestra, you have practiced your instruments technically for hours and hours and hours. And of course, so we, when, when we come, not only do I think that we need to have all these uh, ideas and thoughts and everything that Caroline and Natalia have just beautifully said, but also the clearest not just verbal, but physical and uh, gestural language to transmit these uh, thoughts through. Clarity, clear, reliable. Um, and these things, of course, are things that professional orchestras are very happy about. If you can, you can not talk too much and you can show through, through gesture all these things you mean and distill all these ideas into a little look which just has exactly the result that you want. Um, and that, this is tricky to, to practice at home. But I think, you know, you have a mentor and you study conducting properly like, like a craft. I think that's key. Can I just say, you. Oh. Oh, sorry, Kath. I was just going to say, I, I was sitting here thinking what a pleasure it is to compare notes with other conductors because it's not something we get to do terribly often. We, we work alone. So this is really interesting. Yeah. Sorry, Caroline. Great. <laughs> that's all right. So our poll is in. So 49% think that carbon capture is your, would like, you'd like that to be your superpower, Caroline. Is that correct? That's absolutely true. <laughs> Amazing. Well <laughs> and 42% um, Natalia think that you want invisibility. Is that true? It is true. <laughs> Harry, Harry, Potter, Harry Potter, when he has this thing on, oh, I love it. I could go Good anywhere. <laughs> yeah. And Jonathan, it's time travel, is that right? That is absolutely right, exactly. Wouldn't yeah, it be wonderful well, to go back and meet these greats of history and ask them questions? You've got it all right, all bang on with your superpowers, wow. amazing. So our final topic is listening. Who wants to take listening? Ah, okay, well, I'm happy to talk about listening because this is my pet favorite. Um, I think it's, it's really important for a conductor to be a musician and a musician to be a conductor at some point in their lives. Um, and I think listening really comes, the, the truths come home to you as a musician because the more advanced you get, the more you're able to listen and the more deeply and intently you can listen. And um, I think that we have to develop a kind of hypersensitive, if you like, form of listening that's so deep that from the first sound that's made, we are totally immersed and rather like you take um, a, a ride on in the fairground or something, you're on that ride and you're completely involved from both the players and the conductor. And I think you can this way, in, certainly working in rehearsal, you create an atmosphere of, of trust with your musicians, um, of openness so that when it comes to taking risks, because everyone is listening so intently and so on board, um, these sort of exciting things start to happen. Um, I think it leads to sort of a heightened expression where hopefully in the end, in the performance, the whole, the whole performance becomes something greater than all those individual musicians, everyone who's involved. And you're all great musicians. We're all, you know, putting our best into it. But somehow it becomes something bigger still. Well, that's what we're aiming for anyway. <laughs> Great, fantastic. Well, that's all seven topics covered. Oh, and I, I let me just show you guys what, what our amazing team of musicians have been up to while we haven't been able to do our courses because we've been doing our online program. So let's see. They, this is last week's webinar selfie. We had the webinar with Howard Goodall and Debbie Wiseman. And you, you sent in so many lovely oh, pictures. There are gorgeous. just a few of you all. 
So these are the guys that are probably out there listening to us today and they'll do the same with us any minute now. We'll do our, our webinar selfie. You've been having your masterclasses and final section meetups. So here's an amazing clarinet section, all that was going on, some harp sectionals going on. Um, this was a lovely thing that the clarinets did when they found out what they had in common. Everybody had something in common with at least two people and they made a little grid to show um, what connected them, which was lovely. Now this is Helen, our flute tutor, backstage this morning actually, before her flute workshop, having a bit of fun, obviously. <laughs> um, and clarinet, uh, sorry, these are violas. They were dressing up big time for their, they were dressing up as different pieces, I think, um, as, as they went through their sectional today. I think it was, oh no, it was yesterday. And there are flutes having more fun and trumpets looking quite serious, working hard. And they've been doing these amazing musical postcards. I don't know if you've seen any of these, um, but it's when you multi-track yourself with a cappella. So they're playing over each other. And we've done loads of arrangements on the website and they're just unbelievable. It's an amazing Wallace and Gromit on the website. There's um, Watch Me Be The Drunken Sailor up there. This is a Hallelujah Chorus on the left and a Sugar Plum Fairy on the right. And another pirate one. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> Super cute. Yeah, they're amazing. <laughs> then we've got the harp. The harps are joined together to do a, uh, oh, what is it? A sugar plum fairy, I think. Yeah, um, multi track for the harps. The basses have joined together in a multi track um, mambo. And the brass um, have done an incredible fanfare and march and fanfare. So, um, and we're going to launch that one particularly, though we're saving that one till, till the grand finale tomorrow night. The rest should all be up on the website now. Um, they've been doing amazing things with Pick and Mix. There was a quiz, a Harry Potter quiz that was going on uh, yesterday. Uh, so all dressed up for that, which was lovely. And this is Peter, our taskmaster, who's been tasking them with multitasking whilst playing your instrument. So this is having a bath at the same time. This was unbelievable. Oh, wow. This is rollerblading whilst playing the mambo. And what you can't see in this is just around the corner, there's a massive speed bump. So he just, he's going super fast, zooms down the road and goes over a speed bump with his violin. <laughs> this is operating a remote control car while you're doing a practice, <laughs> of course. <laughs> and this is making a pizza while you're doing a practice. <laughs> <laughs> so he's all amazing. Taking a picture while you're doing your practice. And this was one of my favorites. Look at that. Drying your socks <laughs> while you're doing your practice. <laughs> Very practical. Oh, yeah. brilliant, brilliant. That amazing scenery. That looks like a green screen moment, but it isn't because that train actually <laughs> went through the picture. So they're all up on the gallery on the website. So all of you uh, NCO guys, go and check all those things out. Now it's nearly the end of our course um, and the website is going to stay open for, until the end of August. So there's still things on there that you might want to engage with through the rest of August. So there's Mission Escape, which is like the surround sound work we do on the course. There's all those musical postcards. There's 14 for every instrument. So there's loads of you to, to try with those if you want. There's still the listening challenges are there and there's still the wellbeing videos. So if there's stuff that you haven't done yet, take the time and have a little look around. And then if you run out of things, there's all our webinar shorts and other webinars on YouTube as well for you to have a look at. And drum roll. But we're going to have our grand finale tomorrow, which I can't believe it's come around already. Super exciting. Um, I've only just heard an audio clip of the man, but I haven't seen any of the videos yet or anything. It's all being magicked away by our amazing tech team to create something really wonderful. So we can't wait to share all that with you. So um, we're looking forward to seeing you then at six o'clock on YouTube. And that is tomorrow now. So that's fantastic. Great. So, guys, we've got to do our selfie because we're running out of time. What uh, what props have you got for yourself for today? Right. What have we got? I've got a hat that's got holes in. It's the only thing I can find. Well, I'm actually on holiday at the moment, so I've got my sunglasses and some earphones, some music. Okay, that's um, good. Those of you who were on the under have been on the under tens might remember these two. Amazing, <laughs> Bob. <laughs> oh, and Natalia's got a pineapple on her head, of course. Oh, and I've got my. <laughs> Feather duster, great. I think we're looking amazing. So let's strike a pose and I'll count us down. Three, two, one, and you can take the selfie. Okay, three, two, one. Great. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. That's all of our selfie moment. We look forward to seeing those. They'll be all over social media going viral later, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope you don't regret that. Um, <laughs> next time we Google you. 
You'll have a pineapple on your head. <laughs> Brilliant. Next time you're going for a very important job. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Great. Well, um, we've really completely run out of time. So let's finish with one final question. What advice would you each give um, some a young person, one of our young musicians, thinking about taking up conducting? Caroline, do you want to go first? Um, immerse yourself in everything to do with music, learning different instruments, um, scores, listening, learn all you can and develop your listening skills. Uh, do you want to go next, Jonathan? Absolutely. I would say play your instrument as well as you possibly can before you even think of picking up the baton. It's the best advice I was ever given as well. Fantastic. And Natalia, what advice would you give anyone wanting to conduct? Well, I think what we need to have in music is, to, is fun all the time. When you see that you're not having fun, stop for a while, 20 minutes, have a break. When you stop having fun, something is not going wrong. And if something goes wrong, laugh, laugh at your mistakes. Mistakes are, are permitted, are okay. So don't frustrate. Laugh and have fun and enjoy. That's the most thing, making music. Yeah. You can't get better advice than that, those three things. Thank you so much, everybody. So just leaves me to say goodbye to all our amazing children and bye, goodbye and a huge thank you to Caroline, Natalia and Jonathan for spending this time with us and preparing and thinking about all these things so well and so carefully and offering us your wisdom and your expertise and your humour and your fun, which is the most important thing, as we know. So... Um, <laughs> Cheerio, guys. Thank you so much for being with us, and we'll see you again Bye. very soon, we hope. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Kath. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>